Now then, welcome back. So the weather is miserable, Tim Vickery. That's why we thought we would talk to you, because even just talking to you makes it feel a bit sunny or a bit more samba-like. Hello. Yeah, I wish I could help you out, but the weather's fairly miserable over this side of uh, of the Atlantic as well. It's it's very, hence the fact that I'm, I'm dressed up in a, in a collar and tie to uh, protect myself against hypothermia. Very disappointing for this time of year. Now, people watching will understand why I'm commenting on your outfit. People listening, Tim Vickery, this is not how you dress of a casual Monday. You, half the time you don't have a t-shirt on. What's going on here? <laughs> um, a cold spell, and I do. There is a there is a little bit of a dandy who kind of lives inside of me and wants to come out from oh. time to time. So uh, and 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 today he's he's coming out. Wow. He's, he's he's gonna party. I don't usually ask these kind of guys. I'm not a red carpet guy, Tim. But who are you wearing this evening? Who? Which designer? No, it's, 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 this is me on Pelicano shirts. Oh. Uh, Pelicano tie, a fabulous uh, London-based brand which has the slogan uh, uh, Italian style British swagger. <laughs> you put those two together, you've got a winning mix. Well, it's glorious. I've come underdressed for this conversation, but we'll kick on anyway. <laughs> so, international window upon us. We'll be all watching Ireland against uh, New Zealand on Thursday and then Brazil against, uh, or sorry, again, uh, Ireland against Denmark on Monday, whereas I presume the game you'll be keeping close attention on is Brazil, Argentina on Friday, Naturally enough, it's in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah, you're dealing with, uh, with with global brands here. Uh, it's a, it's an afternoon kickoff. It's two o'clock in the afternoon over here, so uh, that will cut down on the amount of people who will be able to watch it. Although in Brazil, it is a holiday, um, not a holiday in 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 Argentina. Um, yeah, friendly schmendly. We can roll out the line of uh, there's no such thing as a friendly between Brazil and Argentina. Fair enough, but extenuating circumstances. Silly season is coming to an end. Next FIFA dates, you have to wait until March for that one. Next time around, it's the real stuff, World Cup qualification. Now, World Cup qualification in South America is serious business. Argentina came very, very close to failing to make it to the last World Cup. Brazil came close to failing to make it to 2002, which they ended up winning. So this is the last chance for the two coaches to get their squads together and play a couple of games before the serious business starts. So there's plenty of stake, and I think it's a kind of high risk friendly for both of the coaches here. Now they met um, just a couple of months ago, just a few months ago in the uh, uh, start of July in the semi-final of the Copa America. Brazil won that one 2-0 fairly comfortably. There was some controversy about the refereeing, but Brazil were clearly the better side on the way to winning that competition. Since then, however, and remember Brazil were at home, since then Brazil have, have played four games and they haven't won any of them. Argentina, under Lionel Scaloni, who was an inexperienced caretaker, who's become the inexperienced uh, permanent coach of Argentina, mm. Argentina have put together some pretty good results since, um, since the Copa America, despite the fact that they've been without Lionel Messi. Now, Messi returns to... Uh, uh, he, he was uh, suspended for opening his, uh, his mouth a little bit too much and moaning about corruption during mm. the Copa America. Messi now returns. So I think the stakes for both sides are a little bit like this. Another game without a victory for Brazil. That would be five on the bounce. That would put the coach under real pressure. For Argentina... That feel-good factor that they've built up over the last four games, they thrashed Mexico in the United States in what was a home game for Mexico. They managed to come down, uh, come back from 2-0 from down early against Germany and get a draw there in Germany, and they thrashed Ecuador in a friendly in Spain. So the results have been pretty good, but that could be a house of cards mm. if they lose heavily against Brazil. And you look at the starting lineup that we're expecting from Argentina, there's Messi, there's Aguero returning to the side. He hasn't been called up since the Copa America. And it looks like another centre forward as well, probably Lautaro Martinez of Inter Milan, who's been doing so well recently. Yeah. Now, that's three up. That's a bold way to go against Brazil, especially with uh, Argentina's defensive weaknesses. So, you know, if that all goes wrong, then uh, the, the, the feel-good factor at Argentina have, have, have built up is destroyed. So uh, I think there are, there are high stakes, even though it's a friendly. OK, well, you set that up beautifully and in your uh, recent piece you presume I'm sure rightly as well that the Brazilian coach would have been glued to Manchester City against Liverpool at the weekend for various reasons obviously numerous players involved mm. but particularly he's looking at the way Firmino is thriving at Anfield in so many ways and he's kind of probably scratching his head a little bit saying we're not really playing to this guy's strengths and when you've lost five no. in the bounce, that might be uh, thought of as a good idea 
Yeah, I mean, as as he would uh, he would admit, the 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 parts aren't quite gelling. When uh, the coach Chichi, when he took over, uh, late 2016, second half of 2016, everything clicked instantly. At the moment, nothing is clicking, and uh, part of of the explanation for that, I think, could be that he's got a little bit of Liverpool and a little bit of Manchester City, and it's not quite working. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. Mm. He uh, He's still haunted, I think, by that World Cup quarterfinal defeat against Belgium when he came to the conclusion that he'd left his side too open against quality opponents. Um, so how has he tried to balance things up subsequently? He's changed the fullbacks, or they've changed the role of the fullbacks. He now wants the fullbacks not to be auxiliary wingers, as, they, as they've been in Brazil for so long. You remember your Cafu and Roberto Carlos yeah. bursting up and down the flank. Instead of that, he wants them just to tuck in, be auxiliary midfielders as well, and maybe get forward from time to time as, a, as an element of surprise. It's a, it's a less physically grueling role. It helps explain why Daniel Alves, although he, he's uh, he's not available for for these games, um, that Brazil haven't picked up any home ba- haven't picked any home base players. Why Daniel Alves, uh, even at his advanced age, is still in the frame for Brazil and is still the captain. Uh, and uh, and the, the coach said to me, he said, "What we want now, we don't want Liverpool fullbacks. We want Manchester City fullbacks." Hmm. But he's got the Liverpool centre forward, Roberto mm. Firmino, mm. and they haven't been able to get the best out of him. Now, if you look at the, the way that Liverpool operates, and Firmino is not a is not by any means a conventional number nine. He likes to drop deep. He's got uh, Salah and Mane running past him, getting close to him, and the width is provided by those two magnificent attacking fullbacks. Um, so uh, it's it he, he, Firmino thrives in a system that Brazil are no longer playing. Now, it hasn't been working, and I'm fascinated to see what Brazil do for these games. They've got Argentina, and then a few days later, they, they play South Korea. And one, exa- one option is to go back to, especially the left side, a full-on attacking fullback. They could use Renan Lodi of Atletico Madrid, who's very, very promising in that role. Another possibility, there's been a late call-up for big Wesley Moraes of Aston Villa. Now, for some time, Brazil have struggled with that centre-forward position. Mm. Uh, and uh, finally, they've brought in an out-and-out centre-forward into the squad. I doubt he'll get much of a run against Argentina, but certainly against South Korea, it might be something that Brazil have a look at, even if as an option off the bench. Because, uh, you know, Firmino doesn't give you a lot of penalty area presence. And in the way that Brazil have been playing, when he drops deep, He's often clashed into the same space as the playmaker, like Felipe Coutinho mm. uh, or Neymar, as it, as it was last time around. Neymar not available this time. And now, Liverpool, clearly, they don't play with that type of player. They don't have a playmaker. So uh, how to get the best out of Firmino, how to how to get the parts fitting better for, for, for the collective, these are things that Brazil still have to work out. And these two friendlies are, are important uh, to them for that reason. OK, because clearly asking Firmino to lead the line in any kind of traditional sense will end in no. along predictable lines. Yes, yeah, it's not going to happen. And he's been left very isolated with the way that uh, that, that Brazil have played, with the, the wide men sticking wide, you know, the, the, the width supplied by the, by, by the wide attackers and not by the fullbacks. So it hasn't really been working. Um, adjustments are needed. I'm fascinated to see what Brazil, under pressure, come up with in these games. Yeah, OK. And then Argentina, Messi coming back, and you mentioned Aguero and Martinez, and that would be a very attacking pro- approach if they choose to take it. Any obvious factors behind their recent run of good form, the feel-good factor you talked about? Well, part of it, I think, is is Messi. And even though he's been missing, you know, Messi in the Copa America, he clearly decided that uh, he, he is going to be vocal, he's going to be a spokesman, he's going to talk. It was a very different kind of Messi. And Angel Di Maria, long-term, long-term international colleague, was talking about that. He was saying it was such a different Messi. I like this Messi. Mm. You know, before there was always the idea that, uh, that he, he, he stayed on his own and maybe he talked to his old mate Aguero but wasn't very communicative, uh, communicative with everyone else. Different Messi. And getting Messi on board has clearly strengthened the position of the coach, Lionel Scaloni. I think it's probably uh, determined in, in, uh, in, determine in, in Scaloni being appointed on a, on, on a permanent basis. There's also an interesting generation of players coming through. They've got a good generation of young midfielders. Uh, Ezekiel Palacios of, of River Plate hasn't been called up this time because of the final of the Libertadores. Um, Nico, Nico Dominguez of Vélez Sarsfield, who looks like he's going to Bologna next season. 
Real deal. Genuine article. Alexis McAllister, who Brighton have signed, he's on loan at Boca Juniors at the moment. Talented. So there's some talented players come, coming through. Lautaro Martinez has had a, had a wonderful few months for club and for country. Mm. The problems for Argentina remain goalkeeper, back four. They don't really have uh, definitive solutions yet in those positions. And that's why it could be such a risky strategy against Brazil, going with Aguero, Lautaro Martinez and Messi. They did it in the Copa America. Uh, it worked to a certain extent because uh, Aguero uh, worked so hard. He, he, he chased back. You wonder if he'll pay the price for this, mm. for all the work that he put in during this uh, th- this Premier League season. Um, but, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to take on Brazil with three players of whom you don't expect a great deal of marking, that's a high-risk strategy. Yeah, it sure is. It sounds like it's going to be a very interesting game. And when we're halfway through the World Cup cycle and Qatar starts coming into focus and we're on the eve, if you take March as being the eve of uh, World Cup qualification resuming, do you look at either group, Tim, and think, you know, with two years and things uh, developing nicely, we could have real contenders here? Well, Argentina are going to have to come up with defenders, fullbacks, centre-backs. Um, you look at the, uh, the the defenders that they, they've picked. So in Otamendi, who seems to be surplus to requirements at the moment at Man City, uh, and you wonder really if Man City have made an awful blunder in not replacing him. Um, he's, he remains the senior centre-back. Marcos Rojo also called up. He's had to pull out through through injury. Um, so uh, the, these positions, centre-backs, full-backs, goalkeeper, uh, are, are still a, a problem for Argentina. And you, you, you really can't see them winning a World Cup if, if they're not going to defend well. Um, from the point of view of Brazil... I think there are promising signs there. They, they've got a, a good generation coming through. It's the first call-up now for Rodrigo, the teenager who's made such a great start at Real Madrid and of whom they have they have huge hopes. There are one or two problems down the line. Um, their, their big idea to uh, phase out gradually Thiago Silva at centre-back uh, is uh, Eda Militão, who's uh, not having a good time at Real Madrid so far. That, that, that's a little problem, yeah. um, as well as the collective problems we're talking about in, in, in the parts not quite fitting together. Who is the long-term centre-forward going to be? Because surely they, they need a, a penalty area operator. Is Wesley Moraes good enough? He's unknown to the Brazilian public, which means that he, you, you've got to take your opportunity, because if not, um, opportunity won't, won't, come, won't come knocking again. Um, but at, at this point, looking ahead to, to the next World Cup, I would have thought that Brazil a better position than Argentina because uh, Argentina, those defensive problems are not going away. Just a final point regarding the domestic game. It's always good to check in and see what's going on over in that part of the world. The Copa Sudamericana has thrown up a nice story. This is the Europa League version of South America. That's is that right. right. Yeah. yeah. Kicks off a new era um, because uh, the tradition over here is the two-legged final, the home and away final. The, the, the authorities have, uh, have changed that this year. It's now a one-off final on a, on a neutral um, ground. Now, that, that can provide real problems for the fans because uh, South America is huge. Distances are vast. Travel is expensive. Income is, is badly distributed. Um, the, the reason for the change, I think, is twofold. One, they think uh, it has commercial advantages. They can, they can easily, uh, more easily sell a one-off game in, a, in, a, in an attractive time slot than two games in the middle of the night European time. And also there's a hope that the quality of the spectacle will be, will be better. Um, you, you, get, you, get a, you get a good game rather than a game in someone's home ground where the ball boys are hiding the ball and so on. Yeah. Um, it, it hasn't got off to the greatest of starts. The, the main event, the Libertadores, the, the Champions League equivalent, the final there set for Santiago, Chile. When they announced that as a venue, they would have patted themselves on the back and saying, we've got the most stable country in South America. Oh, no, you haven't. Chile has erupted in social protest and they've had to move the venue to Lima in Peru at huge inconvenience to a number of the fans. With the, the Sudamericana, the Europa League equivalent, we had two relatively minor sides without a, a, a serious title between them. Colón of Argentina, a provincial side, and, and a team from Ecuador, Independiente del Valle, who are a tiny side who 10 years ago never even played in the Ecuadorian first division. They're a remarkable success story based on producing players, selling them, producing more, selling them, producing more. And they're doing this wonderfully, wonderfully well. Now, this uh, final, Asuncion, Paraguay, the problem here, the obvious problem is the heat this time of year. It was furiously hot. There was a fan who actually died of a heart attack on the way to the, to, to the game, and the heat is considered a factor. But come game time, suddenly the heavens opened. 
a real torrential downpour. And within 15 minutes or so, the game, the, the, the pitch is unplayable. So we had a suspension of an hour. Well, the, well, they waited for the rain to drop off a little bit and try to clean the water off the field. So uh, um, this move to a one-off final, it seems jinxed at the moment, mm. but not jinxed for Independiente de, de, Del Valle, who played very, very well. Wonderful, composed football. They got a young Spanish coach. Um, they were collective in, in, in defence, little clusters on the ball, fast wingers, and they won a thoroughly deserved 3-1 win with a little bit of late drama. It is a remarkable success story. And the last time that uh, a continental title in South America eluded the big two of Brazil and Argentina, you've got to go back uh, to mid-2016 when the Libertadores was won by Atlético Nacional of Colombia, who beat in the final... Independiente del Valle. Okay. What a remarkable success story. Little club from Ecuador, they're outperforming giants all over the continent. Okay, very good. Tim Vickery, as ever, thanks so much, Tim. Thank you.